So this is a 32-bit pipeline MIPS processor that I worked on while I was in college. Being that it's a MIPS processor, it uses reduced instruction set computer, also known as RISC architecture. This means that it uses a small, highly optimized set of instructions. These instructions are governed by a load store architecture, meaning that all of the instructions operate using registers apart from the load and store instructions used to access memory. In total, my processor can execute 23 different types of instructions. The main functionality of this instruction set is adding, anding, noring, oring, subtracting, and XORing register values together, loading values into registers, setting if less than, branching, loading values from memory, as well as storing values to memory, and finally, no op, which is essentially the equivalent of doing nothing. Now the main complexity for this project comes from it being pipelined into three stages, which are fetch, decode, and execute. I feel like in order to fully explain the pipeline nature of this project, I should quickly touch on single cycle processors first. So in a single cycle processor, you completely finish one instruction at a time. This means that you can only start the next instruction once the current instruction is finished. With pipeline processors, however, you're essentially multitasking and doing multiple things at once each clock cycle instead of waiting for each instruction to finish. The classic example to demonstrate this is a washing machine. Suppose you have four loads of laundry and to complete each load of laundry you have to wash, dry, and fold it. Using a single cycle approach you sequentially wash, dry, and then fold the laundry and then you repeat the process for the next three loads of laundry. With this approach, you just wait around and do nothing until the first task finishes. Then you move on to the next task, and then you repeat the process. You wait around and do nothing until this task finishes, then you move on to the next task until your load of laundry is finished. Assuming that it takes 30 minutes to wash the laundry, 40 minutes to dry the laundry, and 20 minutes to fold the laundry, it will take you 6 hours to finish washing, drying, and folding all four of your loads of laundry. Let's compare this to using a pipelined approach. Now when you use a pipelined approach, right after you wash the first load of laundry and it finishes washing, you place it in the dryer and can immediately start washing the next load of laundry. After both of those finish, you can the second load of laundry to dry, you can start washing the third load of laundry, and you can start folding the first load of laundry. The washing, drying, and folding process occurs in parallel. Assuming the same wash, dry, and fold times as a single cycle approach, it takes you three and a half hours to finish all four loads of laundry. That is a lot faster than if you were doing it sequentially or using a single cycle approach. A very important point to understand here is that we haven't actually sped up the laundering time of a single item. It still takes the same amount of time for a single piece of laundry to enter and leave the system. But we have improved the throughput of the whole system, meaning that we are able to complete more loads of laundry as time passes than if we were to sequentially wash, dry, and fold all of the laundry. This same logic applies to a pipeline processor. You are generally able to execute more instructions in a shorter amount of time. For my processor, this is the fetch stage, this is the decode stage, and this is the execute stage. In the fetch stage, I determine what the program counter address, or PC address is, and then I retrieve the instruction that corresponds to that address. In the decode stage, I determine what the instruction wants to do, and I also retrieve any registers that are being used within that instruction. 
or if I'm loading to and from memory, I get the address that I want to read or write to. I also detect any hazards that need to be dealt with within my processor. Finally, in the execute stage, I perform any action that the instruction wants me to do. I read from or write to memory if needed. I update the PC address for the next instruction. I forward data to the next instruction in the processor if it needs it. And finally, I write data over to the register if they need it. There are, of course, some hazards that give the processor trouble and result in instructions taking longer to execute. This is where the hazard detection unit comes into play. One of these hazards is branching. In my processor, I take the route of assuming that the branch will not be taken, which prevents all the other instructions from having to wait until the branch is determined. If a branch is taken, then I simply flush every instruction that is currently in the processor, which means that I basically prevent them from executing or finishing. After that, I then continue from the new PC address that results from taking the branch. Another important hazard occurs when there is an instruction that uses the data that was updated in the previous instruction. Since the previous instruction hasn't finished going down the pipeline yet because it's in the execute stage, I need to find a way to get that data over to the previous instruction. The route that I take is I just forward the data over to that instruction if it needs it. Otherwise, if I didn't do this, I'd have to wait for the previous instruction to exit the pipeline first. The forwarding is done in the data forwarding unit. Finally, when I load a register with data from memory and then try to access it on the next instruction, I need to stall the pipeline for one clock cycle to give the processor enough time to finish writing or retrieving that data from memory. This allows me to forward that data over to the register on the next clock cycle. When installing the processor, I also need to preserve the state of the PC address. All of these different aspects come together and that's essentially how my processor works. Now that the processor part's out of the way, let's look over the assembly slash machine code used in this project. The assembly code is just the part that's readable by humans, and the machine code is essentially the numerical conversion of the assembly code that the processor interprets. Apart from this assembly code, I have a separate file called datamem that contains 512 32-bit data values, which are represented by eight hexadecimal digits. In my assembly code, I use a bubble sort algorithm to sort all the values in the datamem file in descending order, which is from highest to lowest. I treat all of the values in the data mem file as signed values, meaning that the first bit in the value determines whether it is negative or positive. In order to get the value of each digit, I take its twos complement. This means that values starting with a 7 are considered to be the largest numbers, and values starting with an 8 are considered to be the smallest numbers. After sorting these values, I then add the 32 largest numbers together and the 32 smallest numbers together. After this finishes up, I OR every value together and finally I perform a checksum on all the values, which is essentially just adding everything together. Finally, I store the results of each of these operations into data mem addresses 0 times 100 through 0 times 104. The result of adding the 32 largest numbers goes into address 0 times 100. Adding the 32 smallest values goes into 0 times 101. Anding everything goes into 0 times 102. Oring everything goes into 0 times 103. And finally, the checksum result goes into 0 times 104. Alright, so let me open up the simulation so we can see what the results are. These different files represent the Verilog implementation of 
the diagram that I went over previously. It's basically the equivalent of that diagram. As you can see in my test bench, I'm reading data from the instruction mem file. This is pretty much the assembly code that I went over with you guys. It's just the numerical version of that, which is the uh, machine code of it. It's all right here. In my test bench, I am also loading data from the data mem file, which I also previously talked about. This is just the file that contains the 512 unsorted values. Let me open that up and show it to you guys, just so that we're both on the same page and we know exactly what's in the file. As you can see, it starts at memory address 0 times 200 and there are just 512 values. They're in no sorted order or anything. They're just all there. All right, let's skip over to the simulation. I'm gonna run it and I'm just gonna fast forward to the end of it just to save some time. All right, it looks like it's done. Now, it took a while to display the rendered version of the simulation on my computer, but in actuality, my processor executed the instructions fairly quickly. Let's see what the final time is. Okay, it says that it completed it in 35,444,700 nanoseconds. Let's convert this to seconds to see how long that really is. It looks like it's 0 0.03 seconds. That's not even a 20th of a second. That's pretty darn good considering we used a bubble sort algorithm on the 512 different values and then performed a bunch of logical operations on them. Alrighty, so let's look at these final results. Let me open up the data mem. Get hex value. Okay. Now, all these green lines represent the different variables that are being updated each clock cycle within the processor. You can see how all these variables are changing during each clock cycle. Going through what happens every time the clock cycle changes, it take a tremendous amount of time. And for the sake of not making this demo unnecessarily long, I'm just going to skip to the final result. What we're going to look at is this data mem file. Now, if we remember correctly, the value started at 0 times 200. And since they're signed numbers, the biggest number should start with a 7. Now let's make sure that they're all sorted. They're descending. Yep. Okay. And here is where all the negative numbers are starting. And everything look, is looking good. And at the very bottom, it should be all the numbers with the 8 on them. That looks about right. Okay, now let's make results of all these logical operations are in the right place. We told the processor to store all these values at memory address 0 times 100 through 0 times 104. As we can see, there are the five different values that we told it to store. Now the only thing left to do is make sure that these results are actually correct. Well, the anding and the oring of the results are obviously correct since anding 512 different values together would logically result in all zeros and oring 512 different values would obviously result in all f's as expected. So these two are good. Now we just need to verify the correctness of these three values right here. Uh, what I did is I also 
type the outputs right here on this window so that it would just be a little bit easier to distinguish what value means what. So let's see if these addition values are actually correct. Now I have a separate file here called sorted data mem, which basically just has all of the numbers in that data mem file that already in sorted order. It's uh, exactly the same as the values over here. They are exactly the same. So let's go back to that file. Let's check to see if the 32 biggest numbers added together, if that value is the same as the value that our simulation gave us. I'm just going to use a online adder just to save a lot of time because doing this by hand would take forever. So here's the value of adding the 32 biggest numbers together. One thing we do have to keep in mind is that we are dealing with 32 bit digits with our processor, meaning that we're only using 8 bits of data. Anything besides that, those 8 bits, uh, is getting discarded. So we're only looking at the last 8 bits of the solution. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, So let's see. We have the 32 largest value sum is F78155DD. Yep, looks like that's exactly the same. So we know that that value is correct. Let's add the 32 smallest numbers together. Which are all these down here. Get rid of those and plug in these other 32 numbers. Once again, we're only dealing with the last eight digits of this. Looks about right. So let us see the 32 smallest value sum. We have 23E4FE34. Yep, looks like they are the same. Now there's only one more thing to check the correctness of, and that is adding all the values together and doing the checksum. So as you can see, I've selected everything, copy those, and paste in here, and let's see our results. Checksum is 58AE5216. Yep, looks like that's exactly the same as the result that we get using this online adder. It looks like our simulation gave us the correct values of everything. So what does this mean? It means that my pipeline processor was able to successfully take the instruction set that I gave it and process everything correctly. Isn't that awesome? To think that I was able to successfully make my very own pipeline processor is just crazy to me, you know? Anyways, that about wraps up my demo for my 32-bit pipeline processor. Hopefully I did a good enough job at explaining everything. Thanks for tuning in and giving me some of your time. I appreciate it.